Hey everybody, so I'm Steve Wendell, and unlike probably almost all of you here, I'm not a designer, and if you've ever seen my drawings, they are atrocious. Instead, I'm a behavioral scientist. So I study the quirks of the mind, and in particular, how people get in their own way. How when we say that we want to exercise more, we struggle to do so. When we say that we want to save, we struggle to do so. And in particular, I look at how technology products, our apps, wearables, et cetera, can help people take action. Now, to think about this, um, remember when you first drove a car, or, or for those of you who don't drive, um, when, you first, um, uh, when you first rode a bike. Remember what it felt like? Probably a lot like this. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, am I gonna crash? Am I, is my father gonna yell at me? What am I doing, right? Because, yeah, I'll just lift that out. Um, because there are so many minute motions, muscle movements, foot movements, head gestures, everything that we have to do, all at once in a coordinated fashion in order to drive and not, well, be banned from driving for the next five years because you just crashed your parents' car, right? Now, that terror, sorry, I'm gonna do that a lot because I get really excited, I'm sorry. That terror that we feel, it, well, it goes away over time. And after a while, yeah, we're just looking out. We're looking out over the world. For those of you who bike, right, you're just, you're just pedaling along. You're not thinking about the gear switching. You're not thinking about all the small movements of your legs that you need in order to stay balanced, right? And so you can think of it as those are two ways that we take action. And each one has its own unique struggles, conscious, very effortful, very focused, bloody difficult, and habitual, easy, and automatic. But there's actually a third way that we take action, that our users take action in our products as well, and that's this. That's Uber or a taxi. That's when somebody else just does the work for you. And so I want to talk about these three strategies, how you can help people with that effortful, painful process of consciously thinking through a user interface if they haven't hired Abby to make it nice and simple and clear. Or to build habits over time, or even better, how you can cheat and how you can simply help people the way that Uber does. And you don't have to worry about driving, you're working, on your, you're working on your phone, you're doing email, whatever it might be, right? And these three models of action are what I'm gonna cover today. After some short introduction, I'll talk about both how these processes work and then what you can do concretely to improve your products and understand the obstacles that people face, whichever mode they happen to be interacting. Does that sound good? More or less what you expected? As you'll see, I'm a tremendously informal guy. You can yell out at any time. Jill, I'm looking at you. Any time and say, hey, what do you think about this, et cetera. You can also say, bloody Americans, slow down. That's also, that's also OK, because I have a tendency to get very, very excited as I talk. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a behavioral scientist guy. I study the mind. Um, until last, really, I'm going to do it a lot. Um, until last week, I worked at a place called Hello Wallet, which was a small startup, which built mobile and online applications to help people save money and budgeting. Who here likes budgeting? Yeah, budgeting sucks. And the problem is, we've all tried it before. We've all tried and we've failed. And so our challenge was how do you help, some, help people with something that they have tremendous baggage that they've struggled with and struggled with. And so we turned to behavioral economics and we turned to the techniques that I'll talk about after we failed repeatedly, to be perfectly frank. And so last week, I joined the company that bought Hello Wallet, and now I do very similar work at a, at a place called Morningstar in the US, where I help people save for the future, invest, et cetera. And they serve, uh, they're one of the largest providers in the US. And, um, have offices around the world, but they're primarily uh, focused on the US. So my job, as it were, is kind of the mad scientist behind the scenes, both at Hello Wallet and, and now, as of last week, at, at Morningstar. And so I run you know, formal randomized control trials, basically A-B tests with a slightly different perspective, right? Um, it's the type of stuff that they use when they're testing drugs that will determine whether we live or die. Right? This is the gold standard for understanding whether something is impactful. And so we've run hundreds of these tests, hundreds of these formal randomized control trials, 
to see what helps people engage, what helps them actually follow through and take action, what helps them continue on that path throughout, uh, throughout a long period of time. And so I wrote um, two books about this. Uh, one of them is uh, up at the O'Reilly table, if you guys would like to take a look. Um, I'm also, by the way, giving a, a workshop tomorrow in, in much greater detail about some of these. So what we found at Hello Wallet after, again, repeated and embarrassing failures, and at Morningstar, and at many other companies that we've talked to, is that there is an explosion of research that we can draw upon called behavioral economics and the psychology of judgment and decision making. How many of you know the book Nudge by Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein? Cool, so a, a fair number of you. It talks about, well, the funny things that we do. Why we say that, yes, absolutely, we want, we want all the choices in, word, in the world for our medical coverage. And then once we're given it, we're like, oh, shit, I can't choose between any of these. And you're completely paralyzed, right? And so they write funny books about this. But these funny books can also be applied concretely to our products. And they're doing that. So places like Fitbit, Jawbone, they have behavioralists on staff who are trying to understand what's actually going to help people exercise and not. Opower saved terawatts of energy by, as I'll show you a little bit later, using a bar chart. Just a single bar chart. Saved terawatts of energy. Now, each of these companies, really, behavior change is on the box. They're saying, look, we're going to help you do something, right? Buy our product, Fitbit will help you sleep better, exercise more, whatever it might be. Now, there's also a wave of applications, cutting edge companies and organizations who are applying this in more subtle ways to remove the frictions, to make it easier for people to take action, to understand what obstacles people face. So um, Airbnb, for example, has a behavioral economist on staff who studies how we rate properties. Not to manipulate people, not to coerce them, but to better understand what is it that they really enjoy and what they don't. Because unfortunately, you can't trust what people say. You have to understand their environment. You have to understand where those answers come from. And when you change the Airbnb experience, you can help them enjoy more in subtle ways that they would have never thought of. Obama campaign was famous for doing this in 2008, and as well as the recent election cycle, where they used behavioralists to turn out voters, to find the people who really cared, and then turn them out. OK, so let's talk about how you can actually do this yourself. First of all, does that make sense? Cool? All right, I see some nodding heads. I also see a whole lot of fans. So um, by the way, if you find it um, cooler just to stand up and move around, that's cool too. doesn't bother me. So all right. Now, core behavioral understanding of the mind, you can think of like this. While we're all unique, beautiful people, special and different, our mothers love us because of our uniqueness, when we actually take action, she loves you too. She does. When we actually take action, our minds go through a surprisingly similar process. And you can think about this, whether it is when someone's logging into your app, whether they're tweeting, whether they're joining a social movement, whether they're saving for the future, whatever it might be, there's six things that need to happen. So first, despite how cool your product is, something needs to get people started to think about it and to think about taking action. Now that's to log in in the first place, but even when they're in their application and you've got this brand new feature that is just awesome, something needs to cue them to think about it. And you'll see, by the way, this um, spells the acronym CREATE in, in English. I'll go through what you think the steps are. Now, once somebody has this cue to start thinking about it, right? Um, hey, I want to exercise more. Let's say it's, uh, let's say it's um, Fitbit because on my wrist, and it's very obvious. Once the mind starts thinking about an action, it has an uncontrolled, automatic reaction. Now, have you guys, uh, are you familiar with the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell? Cool. So that's what he's talking about. He's talking about what's known as our system one reaction. It's a mix of our emotions, our habits, and our intuitions that guide us. Hmm, is this a good idea or not? It's literally the goosebumps on your arm, the gut feeling you get. That's where this comes from, right? Now, after that split, section, split second automatic reaction, then the mind can evaluate consciously, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea, right? And if it is a good idea overall, then it's a question of ability. Can I take this action? 
Do I know what's required? Do I have the password to the website, et cetera? And if so, well, should I do it right now? Exercise is great because it is always important. And you know, it's never really urgent. It literally is not going to kill you if you don't go to the gym today. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. There's no inherent urgency, unless there's somebody really cute at the gym that you want to show off to, who happens to be that, that, that day. Otherwise, there's no inherent urgency to exercising at one particular moment or another. We create that urgency. Now, when we have that urgency, then there's the overriding power of past experience. So if, for example, I had gone and, uh, and, and went running with my buddies and I had a great time, then all of this process becomes so much easier next time, right? If I'm using RunKeeper or I'm using Moves or I'm using any of these uh, exercise apps that are out there and I had a great time the first time, that means I'll be thinking, I'm more likely to think about it, the reaction will be positive, I'll see the cost more than the, I'll see the benefits more than the cost, et cetera. And if you had a negative reaction that first time, you're basically hosed, as are your users. If you burn them that first time, all of this process becomes immeasurably more difficult than when they're newbies. So we have to be extraordinarily careful. Now, let me walk through what this actually means um, in terms of the user interface. So how do you cue people? I know your products are cool. I know what you're asking them to do is just wonderful. They're not thinking about it. They're thinking about their kids. They're thinking about their jobs, et cetera. So, well, you send them a message. There's a great study by behavioral economist Dean Carlin, um, John Zinman, and others that showed that they had a group of people, they actually did it internationally, US, Peru, et cetera, and they asked them, hey, do you want to save? So I do finance work, so I get a lot of examples like that. Do you want to save money, right? And they say, yes. And then people don't, right? Because they got other things going on. Simply sending them a text message that said, you said you wanted to save, 12% boost. Overnight, Sim simple text message, right? Now, how many of you have sent email before? Anybody? <laughs> email? Right, cool. So um, when did you send the email? What time exactly did you send it? Just think of any of them, right? Of course, we send email all the time. This is a stupid question. There's no time we send email. We send them all over the time, right? We send them whenever we're convenient. We send them when we're sitting in a, in a session like this. And you're, you know, you're kind of, kind of zoning out a bit and you need to send that message. It happens, I know. These tiny details we find are immensely important. This is an email sent to one of the largest retailers in the country, their employees, changing from what is a standard time in the email marketing literature, which is your Tuesday or Thursday morning, to Sunday evening. 75% increase in engagement, in this case, uptake of the product. It was free. We're not trying to, not trying to push it on. 75% increase by changing the time at which we sent a message. This is a randomized control trial, completely identical populations, randomly selected into these. What action do we make in our designs, in the wording choice, in the layout, that has a 75% increase, or for that matter, decrease, in the usage of your products? And the shorter answer is, we have no bloody idea. It's quite possible that lots of things do. Small details like this matter. And when we start digging into the behavioral literature, we see, oh my lord, the small changes in wording, as I'll show you, how we present incentives, how we talk about time, they have impacts like this, 75, 100, 200%. Crazy. The challenge is figuring out which ones, and that's what this Create framework is for to remember which things are most important, from the literature at least. There are always other examples. So, Nest. I know this is US, and I know, we're in, I know we're in Portugal, a place where you don't need a thermostat, because it's always sunny and beautiful. But for those of, us who, so for those of you who live in Portugal, imagine that you don't live in paradise. Just, just work with me, OK? Um, imagine that you had to, well, heat the house at some point rather than just cool it in the middle of summer. So what is Nest? All right, for everybody else who now who's used to this and they're already not in paradise. What is Nest? What is this thing? Right. It's a learning thermostat, right? Um, it's a thermostat. It's a, it's a learning thermostat. Um, most people don't know that over the last 10 years, especially over the last five, m most thermostats were programmable, learned in some way, et cetera. But Nest, Nest is different. Nest is not a thermostat. It is not a rusting box that you have some, in some corner of your 
of your wall that probably has mercury in it and might kill you. Instead, nest is something that you buy and you put in a prominent place so that when your friends come to your house, they will see it and know how sophisticated you are. <laughs> nest is about the reaction. It looks and feels different than just a thermostat. It has different associations. Designers know this. A lot of behavioral science is really about uncovering what you guys have known for a long time and putting structure and boundaries and numbers about their importance. So in this case, there was a horrible prior association with thermostats, and so they made it look completely different. They invested in design to break those prior associations. So what I should have said earlier is that at each stage of this funnel, people drop out. Right? They drop out because they get distracted. They drop out because hmm, they have a prior negative experience. And you lose them at all parts of the way. So we look for those obstacles. We look for whether it's the oh, thermostats, those are just boring utilitarian. Why on earth would I pay 300 bucks for something boring and utilitarian? Oh, but I'll throw 300 bucks for this. It is lovely. Now, another technique that you can, that you can use to overcome this sense of uh, this emotional reaction, if it's one of, um, of fear and distrust, right? if it's something that's unfamiliar to people, you can show that it's normal. right? This is um, uh, work by Alcott and others uh, talking about O-Power. So I mentioned O-Power, terawatts of energy saved. Do you guys remember mail? It's paper, it comes through a slot, you throw it out. Paper comes through a slot, you throw it out, right? So they, or if you like, comes from the sun, Thich Nhat Hanh, we're all connected. Just riffing on, uh, on Abby's riff of, of the previous one. So they have saved terawatts of energy, which, by the way, is enough to power small towns for eons or something. Uh, it's a big number. Um, their innovation was to send a bar chart, one bar chart once a month on this antiquated thing called mail. right? And that bar chart said, hmm, you know, you're spending 200 bucks on energy every month. Is that good or is that bad? I have no bloody idea. He's spending 100 bucks. Now don't you feel like an idiot? That's the power of that bar chart. It's a simple comparison. Once we see what, how other people are doing, we have two thoughts. The yes, I can, and yes, I should. Yes, I can. Oh, there must be some way that this otherwise person, so they control for income and house size and all that stuff, right? There must be some way that this other person did it. Let me learn how. That's on the back of the sheet. It tells you all the stuff you can do. The other is, yes, I should. Oh, my. He's probably judging me, and I'm, I'm screwing up here, right? Even though they can't see you, even though it's anonymous, we have this, it's called a spotlight effect, the sense that we are constantly being watched and judged, which probably you are, but we exaggerate it too much, right? That's the normative comparison. We did a similar thing within Hello Wallet. Um, we saw an increase in the savings of everyday Americans, about 600 bucks. Americans are actually pretty darn terrible at savings, so that's about double the US savings rate by using, in this case, a little daily thingy. Two little daily thingies comparing people, right? Tiny changes. If people, if an action is new to people, show that it's normal, right? Show that it's possible. Show that other people are taking this action. We look to our environment for cues on what's right, and by and large, our products, our mobile phones, etc., they are our environment. They shape what we decide is normal and what we do, OK? Now, on the evaluation side, um, uh, how many of you guys uh, work in product design, working on mobile apps, et cetera, working on desktop apps? Right, most of you. Um, how many of you um, don't know why your product is good? Yeah, we usually do this part really well. <laughs> we usually can express, hey, my product will whatever it is, right? Save the world, et cetera. However, we're not as good at stepping out of our box and realizing that we th what we think is the bee's knees, sorry, what we think is really cool, what's the best aspect, isn't necessarily what other people care about. There are many facets to any, any interaction, to any action people might take. Exercise, smoking cessation, learning a new language, et cetera. And so look at this example. Uh, this is from Witch Test 1, by the way, which is the best repository of, of A-B tests and randomized controls out there. It's got about 400, 500 different studies. It's great. Um, so everybody knows this is an insurance, um, insurance ad. Everybody knows that insurance gives you peace of mind. If you talk about it as insurance will give you peace of mind and it won't be a pain in the butt, small changes in wording and presentation, 52% increase. 
just from that tiny change, right? Now, you may notice there are a couple other things on there as well. Now, in terms of ability, there are two factors here. So one of them is, do you know how to, uh, can you actually take action? Do you have the password, et cetera? And then do you know it, right? Do you know what to do? That's why the first time user, is so, user experience is so important because it gives people what's known as a sense of self-efficacy, Bandura's work. A sense that when they take the action, they won't look like idiots, that they won't fail. We don't do things that we think we're going to fail at, by and large. Our minds prune those ideas from the tree. They're just not there. And so if your product may seem completely obvious to you, but it's something that for other people is strange and foreign, make for darn sure that it's clear that it will be easy and what the steps are and they don't have to find them out beforehand, right? Now, um, one technique, this is from Katie Milkman and others, one technique you can use is to help people think through what are those steps. So, flu shot, anybody wanna get a flu shot? Great. Ask people, when exactly do you, would you like to get a flu shot? Don't hold them to it, no commitment, no incentives, et cetera. 14% increase, like that. Just by having them think through the steps. It's called implementation intentions in the literature. So, Twitter's great. Because when can you read Twitter messages? What? You can read them now, right? You can write messages. You can also read them when you're on life support and you're almost at your passing. They will always be there. They're never going away. There is nothing inherently urgent about a Twitter message, about a tweet. I'm sorry. But when I see, oh, there's a tweet. There are two. Or three, shit, five, six, what's going on? Then I feel that I must not be left out. I must take action right then. It's a type of constructed urgency. It's cadence. I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? And you want to be involved, and you want to find out. Now, that is the effortful, conscious choice process, right? Thinking through how can we help our users with these small actions actually follow through. Ideally, though, we don't want to do any of that. We want to build habits. Habits are great. Well, of course, they can get a little overdone, but we want to build habits for our users to do beneficial things, right? Whether that be saving for the future, whether it be exercising, et cetera. And so a habit, strictly speaking, is basically it's outsourcing of your behavior to your environment. That's what Wendy Wood says. She's the leading researcher in this. And it's when you have some trigger like walking to work, smell coffee, go into Go into the coffee shop, buy it, start drinking it. Before you think about anything, before you're even thinking about that purchase, that's a habit. The cue is the smell of coffee in the morning. It's a contextual uh, sensation. And the routine is walk, 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 bring out money, pay money, drink, right? What's beautiful about this is our minds can be doing other things. They can be thinking about our job. They can be thinking about that, that jerk who cut us off when we were driving in, whatever it might be. And often we're pulled forward by some reward the, the taste of the coffee, whatever it might be, but it's actually not required. Our minds only need this repetition, do something again and again and again. And so the first way that you build habits is you just have someone do something again and again and again. Unfortunately, that takes months, it takes a bloody long time. There's still actually a lot of great research on that. And this is what most games do, right? And I intentionally used some old examples of games here, of games here because this is nothing new, right? You master a game when you learn the particular small hand twitches that you need to beat up the fighter, to go through the maze, whatever it might be, right? And it is that repetition, it's that habit formation that you feel suddenly that it is effortless. You don't have to think about that. Then you can think strategy, you can think what the other players are doing, et cetera. That's a habit forming. And it is done by simple repetition. Now, there are other ways to do it. So Nir a friend of mine has a book called Hooked, which is, add that extra stage of how do you invest? How do you change the decision-making environment with each iteration, each time you take action? So for example, Evernote. You guys know Evernote? Okay, we had Facebook before, so I know everybody knows Facebook as well. So Facebook, for example, when you don't have any friends on Facebook, it's a little depressing, right? You feel bad, you hope nobody knows that you don't have any friends on Facebook. When you have like five friends, that's worse five people can see, you only have five friends, right? But the more that you add into the system, the more that you use it, the more value it has to you. 
when you've got 100 friends, when you've got 200, and you've got 50,000, whatever it might be, you're much more reluctant to cut the cord. I know all of us have at said point said, screw it, I'm out of Facebook, I'm never gonna use this again. Yeah, but what about those 50,000 relationships? Relationships very loosely defined, right? How do we break those? That's the investment part that, that Nir talks about, right? That as you go through the action, there's more value there with each time. Now, the problem with habits is that if you think about driving, you want the person, you want your user to be cool, suave, everything that the ultimate driving machine should be and its driver, right? Whatever it might be, but they don't start that way. They start like scared teenagers, right? Habits take a bloody long time to form. Now, they're different, they're, they're levels of automaticity, as they say. But in order for someone to feel comfortable, in order to find that mastery of knowing where all the menus are, et cetera, um, knowing how to navigate Photoshop's horrible, horrible architecture, whatever it might be, they start out like this. And so we have to design for both. You can't just jump to a habit. We have to design for that conscious, painful, effortful choice that someone has in figuring out the hamburger menu and figuring out, et cetera, what they have to do. Now, that's a pain. That's hard. It, it means like talking to users. You remember them, right? Doing user research, getting involved. There's, there's a better way. The better way is simply to cheat. So in the, for, yes, there's a punchline coming. In the 401k world, for example, this is uh, retirements in, in the US, um, everybody and their mother says that they want to save for retirement. Right? And they really mean it. And if you put a form in front of them and say, fill out, would you like to save for retirement? The vast majority say yes. If you don't have the form there and somebody just has to pick it up and check it off themselves, you get 50, 40, 30% enrollment. If you automatically check that box, exactly what they said on surveys after survey they say they want to do, right? And let them decide, hey, no, I don't want to do this, huge boost. 30% boost, uh, this is 30, 30 percentage point boost, right? In uptake of, of actual savings, just like that. It's cheating. You're doing the work for them, even though the work is minute. Take form, fill out form, check box in the back, right? Huge boost, these tiny frictions matter so much. And so, oh yeah, there are a lot of other products that do this. If you guys know Digit, it automatically transfers some money from your savings account, uh, sorry, from your checking account to your savings account and of course, oh yeah, that's what these guys do. That's what Jawbone does, that's what Fitbit does. Um, how many of you have ever tried to track how many steps you take manually? One, two, three, four, five, six. I can't even keep track when I'm pacing back and forth on the darn stage, right? It's very difficult. And so you used to have to do that. The same thing, think about meal logging. Anybody tried to log their meals? It's a pain in the butt. And so the smart programs focus on the thing that is uniquely human and that we really must do and commit to ourselves, which is actually exercising and automate away, magically make the problems go away that are painful and difficult and can be automated. And that's what these guys did, right? By automatically tracking your step count. Same thing for moves, same thing for all these other programs, et cetera. Now, there's one little challenge, which is when you automate stuff, are your people actually engaged? Do they care? Do they feel invested in it? And I mean invested like, for example, in 401ks and retirement plans. A huge problem is that when someone changes jobs, they were automatically enrolled, they were savings, and then they get a check, right, for $5,000 from their, from, their, from their 401k. What do they do with that? Do they say, well, I've been intentionally saving all this time. I'm going to put that in my new retirement plan. No, they buy a boat, they go on vacation, or they pay off their debts because they were never engaged. Automation can only get us so far. We can't cheat on interacting with people and making them love our products and making them love what they're doing in their lives. And so let me just give a very quick recap. Sorry, it doesn't matter if you have just the darn coolest product in the world. It doesn't matter if you're helping people in a meaningful way. Well, there's more that we have to do. There are three strategies. We can support that conscious choice. We can build habits. We can cheat. In order for someone to make that conscious choice, which by and large is what they have to do, even if you're forming habits, there's six obstacles that can get in people's way. The lack of attention, 
the strong emotional reaction. The costs outweigh the benefits. Um, they don't have the ability or the self-efficacy. They don't have the urgency, or they have a past prior negative experience or create. You can build habits, and they're wonderful, but it's an investment. It takes time. Or you can just cheat on certain things, on the things that are most hard for people and can be automated away as long as you still keep their attention, make them love what they're doing, because otherwise they will walk away. And that's it for me. Uh, we'd love to hear, I'm literally all ears. We'd love to hear any questions uh, or comments you guys have.